I want to show you something pretty cool about Jesus, something he said, something he did, why he did and said what he said it did, uh, and how it relates to you. You all recall the story about the woman at the well in John 4, the Samaritan woman. Let's pull that up. Let's look at it. I want to see if you can see something that is, I think is pretty interesting. In John 4, if we just start in verse 4, it says that, he, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now, before we go any further, why he said he had to pass through Samaria, we really don't know because Jews typically went around Samaria. They didn't go through because of their, their dislike. Jews didn't like Samaritans and Samaritans didn't like Jews. As a matter of fact, Jews really didn't like anybody. But typically Jews would go around, but Jesus leaving Jerusalem wants to go He's, it seems as though he has an intent on going through Samaria. And I think that's probably the case because of what he uh, intends to say and to whom he intends to say it to. Let's go back to it. And so he says, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So Jesus is tired. And I think strategically he goes to this place where Jacob's well is. Understand, the Samaritans are relatives of their cousins of Jews. Keep that in mind, though. It says, and a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. So not only are you asking a woman, but you're asking a Samaritan woman. We don't have any deals with Jews, which is what she says. She says, for Jews, or in parentheses, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Well, what is he speaking of? He's speaking of not just water. He's not speaking of physical water, but this Spiritual water. Oftentimes you see the Bible kind of uh, makes water and the spirit synonymous. And in this case, it's the same. The Holy Spirit is what he's speaking of. And so he says, if you had known who you're speaking to, you would ask him to give you living water. So in other words, Jesus uh, is letting her know, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me. And it's, he's asking the question or making the statement as though I'm not going to deny you, even though we have this relationship, your people and Jews. That's not the way I'm going to look at you, which should tell you something about how he looks at us as well. We'll get to that in a second, though, but let's continue. The woman said in verse 11, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? So obviously she's intrigued. Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself and did his as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. It's almost as though she's kind of getting it, but she's really not getting it. And so now Jesus wants to kind of touch her. He wants to enlighten her. He wants her to know who he's dealing with. And how does he do that? He deals with her past, though she didn't know he's dealing with her past initially, but she'll know real soon. Look what he says. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for, for you have five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. So let's, so what we'll do is we'll look at what he says and notice how it seems like he repeated what she says, but actually Jesus did not. If you go back to it, he says, go call your husband. She says, the woman says, I have no husband. Now, I want to stop for a second. I want you to look over to the right where she says, I have no husband. Look at the order in Greek, how she says so. She says, ouk, echo, andra. What that means, ouk is not or no, I don't. Uh, Echo is I have, so not I have Andra, a husband. So not I have a husband. Jesus said to her, now the English says, you are right in saying I have no husband, which is how it's, it's spoken of in English. But notice something that Jesus did say. He did not use the same terminology. When Jesus speaks, remember she said, Uk, echo Andra. Jesus says, 
Andra Uk Echo. Why is it changed? And this is what the English doesn't bear out. Why is it changed? Because Jesus gives emphasis, and she catches on to this. Jesus gives emphasis to the word husband. Andra Uk Echo. Now, in Greek, word order doesn't really matter in many cases, but you can use word order to add emphasis. We see that in John 1 when uh, the word theos is shifted to the front to give emphasis of what the word is. Same thing here. Andra is shifted to the front. Andra uk echo, a husband, not I have. You said well when you said a husband. Now, she didn't say it that way, though, but she catches on what Jesus is saying. Yeah, you don't have a husband. As a matter of fact, a husband. And so he starts bowling down her lane and then he opens it up even more. He says, for you have had five husbands and the one now that you have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And what's funny is he said, what you have said is true, which is really not what he, what he said. Uh, she tries to hide uh, in what she's saying, but he gets that. And then what is her response? She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So her eyes are beginning to open. She's beginning to see something about him. And he says, uh, she says, our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem, meaning that you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship, you people, you all, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Then now, and his point is that it's coming from uh, this Jewish lineage. And look what he says. He says, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth and the father for the father is seeking such people to worship him. Now, drop down. Let's skip verse 24, even though it's important, but go to 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I look what Jesus says. He says, I who speak to you am he. But he didn't just say it that way. So she's getting ready to get an extra dose of something special, an extra dose of really a revelation by none other than Jesus. He says, I who speak am he. And he doesn't say uh, in a generic sense, in just a basic sense, uh, I'm that person. No, what he does says, I am I who speak to you, ego ma, hallelon soy, which is uh, I'm the I am. The I am is the one who speaks, I'm he. How do we know that that is more than just, yeah, that I'm that guy? No, because look at how she responds. She runs and says that she's found a man that's told me all about him. Could this be the one? And so why is this important? How, how does this relate to us? How does this help us? How does this kind of show us something about how he treats us, how he looks at us? Well, Jesus is going not around Samaria, but through Samaria, because John 4 says that I need to go, or it seems to indicate, and the King James Version kind of makes it, I think, a little bit clearer as well. Uh, I need to go through Samaria. There's a need to go through Samaria. Well, why? Well, we're going to find out, because we need to go deal with these Samaritans. Because I have a desire to bring them in as well, even though, as Jesus said, salvation is from the Jews. And so what, who does he meet? He meets not just any old Samaritan. He doesn't meet the, the, uh, the high class uh, Samaritan. He doesn't meet some, some, um, uh, some dignitary of the Samaritan clan. He doesn't meet some, some famous person who's Samaritan. No, just some old woman who's trying to get by. She's had five different husbands. And now this last one, this some some guy, some guy sitting on the couch, not married to whoever this guy is, she's with him, and she's I don't even want to marry. We're not even married. Whatever. It's almost as though that she is tired, which is why she says, "Can you please give me this water so I don't have to come here to this well anymore? Uh, maybe my lot in life isn't what it should be or what I would like it to be. So could you at least give me some relief there?" And he indicates her past, meaning. God even knows our past and what is he still willing to do? Still willing to interact with us and to even indicate who he actually is as, as, as interacting with us. Not just any old person, but the I am is interacting, which is why he said when he said, I'm the I am. That's why he used that phrase, this ego eme, 
and her eyes just lit up. She understood and she went back. And what did she do? Overcome with joy and excitement, she tells other people. And we know that Jesus had a desire for the Samaritans because in Acts 1, what does he tell his apostles? When you receive the Holy Spirit, you'll be my witnesses where? Jerusalem and Judea. That makes sense. But then he says Samaria to the Samaritans. And so he's always had this plan, even when Peter and, and John wanted to rain down fire because they didn't, Samaritans didn't receive the gospel. She said, no, you have no idea what you guys are talking about. There is a desire for God even to deal with the people who are the outcasts of the world, the social outcasts, people who have had tattered and, and tainted and bad past, people that others might look down upon, Jesus doesn't. And so Jesus makes this statement to her, I understand what your past is. Matter of fact, he emphasizes your past, but what of it? So what? And so she becomes someone who, because of him, brings other people. What do they say? We Not because of her story, now her calling us to you, but because we've seen and heard you with our own eyes and ears and so forth, then now we believe. And so the good news from this is that not only is God just dealing with uh, the people that are that have a good past, the people that are doing okay, the people that seem to have everything right, good credit, good job, good household, and so forth. No, he is also intentional. Like he said, I need to go to Samaria. I need to go to your backyard. I need to go to your house and deal with you, you who are struggling, you who are hurt, you who are down, you who are depressed. You have all these different things that seem to be coming against you. Jesus says, I need to, in, in a sense, I need to come to people just like you. Tell me that isn't not just good news, but really awesome news. Amen.